Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. It's a delight to return to Walter and Lau Russell and their home study course. And today we have a shorter lesson regarding questions that come up about cosmic consciousness, attaining cosmic consciousness through meditation and prayer. Lau and Walter Russell begin by saying, How often have we told you that the greatest miracle which can happen to you is the discovery of your inner immortal self? We would say that again and again for a thousand times until you fully know that the kingdom of heaven is really within yourself. Let us add to it by telling you that one inspiring hour alone with God, in communion with Him, in His light, is worth more to you than all the possessions of all the earth, all of its jewels, its gold, yes, even its richest thrones. The highest of all the attainments of man we are trying to open up to you through your continued growth of comprehension, do not think it is easy for you to acquire such a high goal overnight. That is impossible. Many write that they have followed our instructions carefully but cannot decentrate to the stillness of zero try how they may. The following is typical of many such questions. A question, although your instructions seem explicit about decentrating to the zero of stillness, I have great difficulty in doing so at will. Does this mean to hold the mind steady and quiet without thinking? If so, it is a very difficult thing to do. Just once have I reached the point of absolute stillness, and it was beautiful. I was unconscious of anything but being merged in that pure light. How I wish I could attain that state at will. The more you can attain that state, the easier it will be to repeat it, Walter and Lau say. Your question indicates that you make too great an effort to accomplish that result. This means that you are concentrating upon having it happen instead of decentrating to let it happen. Do not look for symptoms of it. Do not expect it or try to make it happen. Just say to yourself, I want to be alone with God. And the majesty of that thought and your desire for aloneness with God will drive all things else from your mind. The effort you indicate you are making gives us the impression that you are making your brain very active in trying to make your mind become still. Forget your brain. Forget your body. Take the attitude that nothing in the world interests you, nothing whatsoever. Think of beautiful music to stop your thinking about your grocery bill or your visitor who is coming or any problem that weighs heavily on your heart. Meditation comes from the desire of the soul. Do not let the brain interfere with your inspiring communion from soul to soul. It is wonderful that it happened even once to you, for that means that it must happen again and more frequently as you open your heart to it. You might as well expect to play a symphony after one music lesson as to expect to be able to decentrate to that ecstatic state of inspiration at once. You must realize that your unfolding to the point at which you have already arrived has been a long one. You are ready for the light now, otherwise you would not have so keenly desired it. Our light and our inspirations, however, cannot re-inspire you immediately for you always take instructions or readings first through your senses by recording them on your brain before they are finally absorbed by you and your soul to become knowledge, just as you have to take food into your stomach first before it is absorbed into the bloodstream to become nourishment, the great drawback to the unfoldment of inner vision is that what is recorded on most people's brains never passes beyond them to reach the soul. Very many even expect to attain full cosmic consciousness immediately by applying our instructions. That is as utterly impossible as it is undesirable for one who is not ready for it. Students often write us they have been in metaphysics for 20 years and think that is a sufficient reason for the attainment of the highest and rarest of all human attainments. 
One can be in metaphysics for 50 years without having one soul touched by the light for even one second. The study of metaphysics, like university training, may give one much information without any real knowledge. Many great metaphysical authorities may be able to make many scientifically true statements of fact, but have no knowledge of them whatsoever. They would be unable to explain them if asked to do so. Such a metaphysical authority might be as completely unable to commune with God in his heart as a student of musical history and theory might be unable to compose even a simple melody, much less a concerto. There are many throughout the metaphysical world who perpetually repeat the same scientifically true statements but cannot explain them because they do not know what they mean. Affirmations and quotations without explanations are meaningless even if true or authoritative. Of what benefit if a man says to you, be ye ever transformed by the renewing of your mind, if he does not also tell you how to renew your mind and what with? We have heard such statements as, all things are one, hundreds of times. But when asked to explain how 50 men in the room plus everything else in the universe are one, they become as silent as the scientist becomes if asked what light is or gravitation is. The only way you can ever find that great treasure which is yourself is to be able to decentrate to the point where you can forget your body and be aware of your immortal soul. We can tell you how to do this through these lessons and can undoubtedly re-inspire you with the light of our inspiration, but only through your own great desire in cooperation with the principles, practices, and instructions we are giving you. We cannot even do that unless you let your soul touch your soul instead of just reading our words with your senses. Metaphysical students and teachers have often told us they have known some of the things we are teaching for 25 years. This is not true, for most of the knowledge given in these lessons has never been known on earth. It has come to us cosmically. We want this to be thoroughly understood, for it is important to you that you know the difference between stating a fact which really is a fact, and knowing it. We will give you a simple example to exemplify our meaning. For centuries, people have made these two true statements. God is love and God is light. Yet no one up to this day has any knowledge whatsoever of their meaning. Until today, the meaning of love has a sex connotation to the average man. And the meaning of light has never been defined or explained by science. Every scientific theory of light is a physical one based upon waves and corpuscles. If mankind ever knew the meaning of love, we would have had a different kind of civilization. Its scientific meaning as the giving and re-giving of nature's processes has never been known. Likewise, the scientific meaning of light, electricity, gravitation, magnetism, energy, polarization, atomic structure, and many, many other things has never yet been known on earth and is being revealed in this course for the first time in human history. So much for the true statements which are made but not known. There are an equal number of untrue statements constantly being made in both metaphysics and science, which are believed to be true but cannot be tested as true or untrue because of lack of knowledge regarding them. We will also quote two of these as examples. Metaphysicists and metaphysical books have for years been saying, get into the high vibrations of the spirit and out of the low vibrations of matter. And it is only in your consciousness so it is not real not knowing that the light of consciousness is the only reality. 
there are no vibrations whatsoever to the spirit. The light of the spirit is absolutely motionless, while the vibrations of matter increase with density and decrease as they approach the stillness of space. Such teachings are very confusing when one says in one breath, seek the high vibrations of the spirit, and in the next breath, be still and know. There is one thing in particular, which the divine Iliad message teaches us, that no one has ever heard of before or taught. That is the principle of decentration or expansion of the senses. In order to forget body and become holy mind when in meditation or communion with God. Teachers have taught that one must concentrate in order to conceive idea for creative expression. Such teachings defeat the very purpose of meditation, for concentration focuses the senses to a point and thus forces body awareness while decentration expands the senses towards zero and thus aids body forgetfulness and spiritual awareness. Decentration is a relaxation of the senses to give freedom to the mind to conceive idea from its source, while concentration tenses the seat of sensation in the brain and prevents reaching beyond the electric activity of the brain into the stillness of the seat of consciousness from where our knowledge comes. Our teaching regarding decentration is an entirely new principle for no one has ever thought of or suspected. It as an attribute of the mind until God gave us this knowledge and commanded us to teach it. You have read a few of the words of God's commands in previous lessons. As proof that this principle was never before known on earth or had ever entered human consciousness is that no word which covers that idea has ever been provided. The dictionary makes no provision for the thought for the word decentration is not in it. In the same sense, many will say they know God and have always known him, basing such a statement upon the belief that God exists. Belief is not knowledge. We say to him who believes that he knows God, if you know God, you can define him and relate him to nature and nature's processes. Can you do that? Naturally, he cannot, for no one has yet known God sufficiently to define him as a scientific fact until he himself gave that knowledge through his message to those who are able to comprehend it. That is the way God unfolds all creating things. He gives that for today, which is of today. If God had long ago been definable, there would be but one religion and one concept of God instead of many religions because of the many concepts of God. Out of this new knowledge contained in this message and its teachings will come the one God and the one religion. Nothing can stop it, for it is God's plan to blot out, now, the vast ignorance of man which is keeping him in the barbaric stage of unfolding, where he still kills in order to take, and is himself killed because he still takes, until human relations are based upon the love principle of giving or re-giving which God gave has his one law of rhythmic, balanced interchange in all transactions of man and nature. Mankind will be on the descending direction of self-annihilation in the mass, while the few who do know and who live the love principle will survive. And out of these few, a new civilization will be born, unto the glory of God. We tell you this because of the present decadent state of man in the mass whose ever-growing greed for possessions, even to the whole world ownership, will as surely break him in the measure 
of his own breach of the law. These present wars of man are the manifestation of killing for greed, and greed must disappear before love can be in this world. In relation to this idea, God's words in the message are, If love be in the world, hate cannot also be. Question. How long do you think it will be before people will stop praying to God as a God of fear and wrath and know Him as a God of love? They say just as so long as fear, wrath, crime, selfishness, and greed and the wars which are their harvest continue as the practices of man, just so long will his God be wrathful, vengeful God who invents untold tortures for sinners. Man conceives a God of his own image, and that conception which he imagines always reflects himself. Question, why is it that people ever got the idea of a God of fear and wrath? The Bible is full of it. Why should it be in the Bible if it is not true? They say when man first began to think at the dawn of consciousness, he then began to arise from his jungle ages and was slow to throw off the habits and practices of the jungle. Early man was fearing man of wrath. He feared the wrath of all things, tempest and avalanche, torrid heat and icy cold, which froze his infants at their mother's breast. He feared the jungle animals and reptiles, which smote him mercilessly, even as he himself smote mercilessly. When he suspected the existence of a god, he could not think of him in any other character than a wrathful god of fear, for he knew not else but wrath and fear and killing mercilessly. For he was still brute man, and could not conceive of any other kind of god than a brute god. He could not possibly conceive a god of love, for he had not yet begun to have the slightest trace of knowing what love meant. All during those early pagan and barbarian days, men appeased God and gave him pleasure by slaying men by the thousands, sacrificing their own sons, and shedding rivers of blood upon their altars. They filled fountains with the blood of dozens of animals to baptize newborn infants. They cleansed sinners by plunging them beneath those bloody founts, which we still sing about in our hymns. That is the primate conception of God, which grew out of pagan, barbaric customs. So long as we believe that they are right, we will still be pagan and barbaric. The entire Bible is a true record of the history of its day. It tells of the nature of people of that day, and that record is invaluable to tell us the nature of past ages of people. Long after the Bible was assembled, gladiators still killed each other for the amusement of women and children of their day. In the time of Jesus, the very altars were daily drenched with blood. Kings thought nothing of ordering all male babies slain or of killing thousands upon thousands of prisoners taken in war, sparing only the virgins for their own pleasure. During that time, practically every tribe warred against every other tribe. Killing and looting were common, and people held great festivals to see prisoners slaughtered and their raiment divided. If the Bible did not truly record its day and age, it would be as valueless as a history of today would be if it left out of the atom bomb in order to give posterity a better opinion of us. That does not justify us for the looting, killing, and enslaving which the whole world is still doing upon a greater scale than ever, and will still do as long as it believes in a God of fear and wrath. Question: What evidence is there that the unknown writer of the Bhagavad Gita was a cosmic conscious mystic? They answer all illuminates speak the same language in words which may differ but in meanings which are identical. No matter what words are used by any past mystic, 
Other mystics who follow always recognize the one meaning, which is in all writings, or in the spoken word, such as those of Jesus, who did not leave any written record for posterity. We will quote some passages from the Bhagavad Gita, which sing their own glory in language unmistakable. Another sun gleams, there another moon. Another light, not dusk, nor dawn, nor noon, which they once behold return no more. They have attained my rest, life's utmost boon. I am what surveys, only that knowledge which knows the known by the knower. Fain would I see as thou thyself declarest, Sovereign Lord, the likeness of that glory of thy form, wholly revealed, O thou divinest one. If this can be, if I may bear the sight, make thyself visible, Lord of all prayers. Show me thy very self, the eternal God. Behold, this is the universe. Look, what is live and dead. I gather all in one. In me gaze as thy lips have said, on God, eternal, very God, see me. See what thou prayest. Thou canst not, nor with human eyes. Arjunal ever mayest. Therefore I give thee sense divine. Have other eyes new light. And look, this is my glory unveiled to mortal sight. Of many thousand mortals, one perchance striveth for truth. And of these that strive, nay, and rise high, only one here and there knoweth me as I am, the very truth. For in this world being is twofold the divided one, the undivided one, all things that live are the divided, that which sits apart, the undivided. I am the spirit, seated deep in every creature's heart. From me they come, by me they live, at my word they depart. Every line of the entire Bhagavad Gita is recognizable by any mystic as the unmistakable work of a supreme mystic. Furthermore, any writing purported to be the work of an illumined mystic, but is not as represented, would at once be known by another mystic. The divine Ilian says of this fact, light knows light, and there need be no words. We would suggest that you procure a copy of this work. It comes in several translations. The one we like best is called The Song Celestial and is written by Sir Edwin Arnold. It is a small pocket-sized book. The only other book which we would recommend for you to read upon the subject of cosmic consciousness is the fine book by Dr. Richard Maurice, book published by E.P. Dutton and Company entitled Cosmic Consciousness. Dr. Buck actually experienced the severance of mind from body in a partial cosmic conscious experience for a few seconds or moments which utterly transformed him. His own words are very illumining in this respect. We hereby quote him from pages 9 to 10 of his book. It was in the early spring, at the beginning of his 36th year, he and two friends had spent the evening reading Wordsworth, Shelley, Keats, Browning, and especially Whitman, his mind deeply under the influence of the ideas, images, and emotions called up by the reading and talk of the evening was calm and peaceful. He was in a state of quiet, almost passive enjoyment. All at once, without any warning of any kind, he found himself wrapped around, as it were, by a flame-colored cloud. For an instant, he thought of fire, some sudden conflagration in the great city. The next instant, he knew that the light was within himself. Directly afterwards came upon him a sense of exaltation, of immense joyousness, accompanied or immediately followed by an intellectual illumination quite impossible to describe into his brain, streamed one momentary lightning flash of Brahmic splendor, which has ever since lightened his life. Upon his heart felt one drop of the Brahmic bliss, leaving thenceforward for always an aftertaste of heaven. Among other things, he did not come to believe. He saw and knew that the cosmos is not dead matter, but a living presence, that the soul of man is immortal, that the universe is so built and ordered that without any peradventure, all things work together for the good of each and all. 
that the foundation principle of the world is that we call love, that the happiness of everyone is, in the long run, absolutely certain. He claims that he learned more within the few seconds during which the illumination lasted than in previous months or even years of study, and that he learned much that no study could have taught. Dr. Buck says, page 6, the savior of man is cosmic consciousness, in Paul's language, the Christ. This experience has never repeated with Dr. Buck, but he gave his life to the study of it as related to the few mystics of all time. He lists 37 partial and complete illuminations and cites many extremely interesting facts in comparing one with another, which will help you comprehend the supreme happening much better. When you read of those very few cases out of billions of men born on earth during the last 3,000 years, it should not make you wonder why it does not happen for you immediately after becoming aware of it as an existing fact. Nor should you feel disappointed because we cannot open that door at once for you, which you alone can open. Rejoice, rather, that the light comes to you a little at a time more and more as ignorance is voided by knowing as comprehension of the message gradually reaches your heart and soul. That is why we keep persisting that you take one paragraph at a time and meditate upon it until your soul knows what your senses have read in words and recorded upon your brain until it goes beyond your brain into your consciousness you do not know it. They conclude with a number of letters that had been sent to Lau and Walter Russell, commending them for their training program. A number of them are pretty powerful. Although I've been an earnest student of metaphysics and philosophy for 24 years yet, I was never too sure about my foundation. Your lessons are clearing up many misunderstandings. Ellie Moline in, in Illinois. Your home study course is most inspiring. It is just what I needed. It inspires me with confidence and strong faith that I shall comprehend every bit of it and begin to live every minute in ecstasy and in balance. Even the structure of the course and the manner in which you express your knowledge seems to contain and express to us your infinite balance and loving ecstasy. H.T. from Chicago, Illinois. They go on to say that your next four lessons are extremely important, for in them we will explain the heretofore unknown meaning of what Father Mother means when we speak of God that way. No one yet knows what it means, nor how basic is this tremendous idea of the Creator as being Father Mother of this sext electric universe. When you get these lessons, you will realize the fundamental import of the Father Mother principle in every thought and action of your life and all nature's phenomena. You'll then begin to know the mystery which shrouds the electric thinking process, which extends from the light of mind to manifest the knowledge of mind, and how motion seemingly emerges from stillness to create this physical universe of form. You'll begin to have the very foundation of this majestic illusion of unreality which emerges from the one reality gradually. This idea will be constructed by simple diagrams and simply worded postulates, axioms, and examples which will give you so vivid and clear a comprehension of this sexed electric universe that your inner vision will see God face to face and hear his inspiring inner voice in communion with you in a manner which would be impossible without that comprehension. We believe that we can now make you fully comprehend why this physical universe is not real, being but an illusion of God's imagining. How comforting when one comprehends that in the unreality of matter, there can be no death, sin or evil, leaving naught but love and eternal life. We have long felt that could not be explained to one who has not himself known the complete illumination into cosmic consciousness. But we now fully believe that by laying a proper foundation in point by point simple steps, the unreal universe can be comprehended for the unreality it actually is. The undivided father-mother principle from which emerges the divided father and mother principle of pairs of sexed opposites will be the first simple step in the direction of transforming you into an advanced scientist. 
by taking this teaching one step at a time, you should not only unfold in God's awareness, which means personal happiness to the nth degree, but find yourself becoming a natural scientist and confounding profession in physics as some of our students write that they have already done. Always remember to take these lessons slowly for on first reading you may well miss the deep import of an explanation which may appear too simple to ponder on. A simple story is the hardest to tell and we would add it is the simple story of life that man has made complex by his unawareness of its basic simplicity. Know our every thought is with you always and know too we treasure you so deeply for your help in spreading God's message with us. And this concludes Attaining Cosmic Consciousness Lesson 8 of the Home Study Course by Lau and Walter Russell In this particular teaching, we get a better understanding of knowing and information. Now, one thing I'm accused of all the time, gosh, Brian, you have an hour episode every day. You sure put out a lot of information, but do you really know? Sure. I'm an information junkie and I'm always seeking and gathering new information, but I am in no way saying that I am enlightened. I understand that knowledge is not enough. It's the knowing. And it's different between somebody that studies music and actually can play it. And I'm still a neophyte learning these metaphysical lessons. I'm the metaphysicist they're talking about that knows all about the metaphysics but doesn't know it. I've had experiences and flashes that they talk about but would never claim to be any sort of master when it comes to this. I'm just gathering information. The information helps me to continue along this process. But the knowing of God is something that can be difficult and decentrating to that zero point for all people in meditation can be a very difficult thing. For many people, it takes years to get into a state where they're completely at zero point in their meditation. For some, it's very fast. And this information that we're constantly going over can help you to understand what's happening. You can dip your toe in the water, but to learn to swim is going to be a little bit different. And so there's no way that anybody can truly do that. Some meditations can help, but it's a personal journey for everyone involved. So if you want me to continue reading from Walter and Lau from this series or others, just let me know and I will continue. I do enjoy it greatly, and it's good that some of these episodes have become a little more popular. There's so much more in these future episodes. They're slowly revealing the science behind what they're talking about and giving you a scientific understanding of God. This is what is so amazing about Walter Russell, The Secret of Light, the other works, is that he is scientifically proving the existence of God. For the scientists out there, for the physicists out there, read Walter Russell if you want to gain a spiritual understanding of God. He does it. He proves it. You cannot read Walter Russell and then tell me that God doesn't exist or that there's no proof that God exists. Walter Russell is proving God at the very basic essence of light as both electron and and proton and the way that light works and once you understand it there is no doubt for the doubting mind and that's me too me seeking out this information and presenting it to you is me the doubter constantly trying to get new information to verify and to expand on what I understand Walter Russell helped me to prove scientifically in my mind the scientific part of me that needs to know that God exists. And so these lessons will go a long ways in helping you, the doubter, that doesn't see the actual scientific proof that God exists. That is what's powerful about this stuff. It's very humbling to understand how little I know, but it's also empowering to understand that I have a lot more to learn and, and understand from this information. I would love to attain cosmic consciousness on a regular basis. I try to provide that in my meditations and I hope that you have found some sort of cosmic consciousness in your life because it is amazing. 
and we may go and read some of Dr. Buck's book on cosmic consciousness later as it's mentioned here. In any case, I'd love to get your feedback, how it's going. If you've learned anything from the Walter Russell stuff that has helped you, I'd love to know. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. <laughs>